All right, so we've got the independence of path theorem, and it's great, but how do we use it in the sense of how do we know when a one-form field is a gradient, or equivalently, how do we know when a vector field is a gradient? Well, it's not obvious, but there is a very effective criterion for checking for gradients in the form of the following lemma. Let's say that we've got a one form on Rn, and it is alpha, and it has components alpha i dxi for some functions alpha i 1 to n. This one form on Rn is a gradient if and only if the following holds. We take the partial of alpha i with respect to xj, that has to be equal to the partial of alpha j with respect to xi for all i and j. You check all these partial derivatives and assuming sufficient differentiability on all of r, and then boom, you've got a gradient. Now this is really effective for showing that what you've got is a gradient. But why? Well, here's the idea behind it. Let's say that you did have a gradient. Let's say that alpha was of the form df for some function f. That means that alpha i is the partial of f with respect to xi. Now, what does this criterion become? Well, I take alpha i, that is partial f partial xi. I differentiate that with respect to xj. That has to be the same as the jth component, partial f partial xj differentiated with respect to xi. And we see that in this case, it's clearly true. Why? Because mixed partials commute that thing that we learned way back in volume two. Now, this is the idea for why this criterion is necessary. The sufficiency is not as easy to show, but it is nevertheless true. If all these partial derivatives match up on all of our n, then you've got a gradient. Now this works equally well for vector fields. If your vector field has components fi, functions with respect to the x variables, then you just take the partial of fi with respect to xj and the partial of fj with respect to xi. That works fine. Okay, let's see how this operates in the context of an example. Let's say that I start writing down some random one forms. Are these gradients? Let's say we start with alpha given by quantity 2xy plus x dx minus quantity 5 minus x squared dy. What I do is I take the first component and I differentiate it with respect to the second variable. That is the partial with respect to y of quantity 2xy plus x. That gives easily 2x. Next, I take the second component, minus quantity 5 minus x squared, differentiate that with respect to the first variable, x. That partial derivative is also 2x. That means that this is a gradient one form. Okay, if I look at another one form on R2, let's say I have quantity 3x minus 2y dx plus quantity 2x plus 3y dy, then following the exact same procedure gives us what? I take the partial with respect to y of 3x minus 2y. That gives us a constant negative 2. Then the partial with respect to x of that second component, 2x plus 3y, that's positive 2. These don't match up. That means this is not a gradient one form. And in fact, there's a little bit of rotation going on in that guy. Okay, here's an example on R3 in xyz coordinates. I have quantity 3yz squared minus 4xz dx plus 3xz squared dy plus 2x times quantity 3yz minus x dz. All right, roll up your sleeves because we've got some work to do. I need to take the partial of the first component with respect to the second variable, then the partial of the second component with respect to the first variable, then the partial of the first component with respect to the third variable, then the... Oh gosh, I'm, uh, I'm exhausted already just trying to read it out loud and I haven't even done the partial derivatives. But if you do enough work, you can show that this is indeed a gradient one form on R3. And from this, you can see how hard this is gonna be when you start getting up to higher dimensions. There's a quadratic number of derivatives you need to compute, quadratic in the dimension in which you're working. Okay, well, that's a lot of work. And even once you've done that, even once you've shown that it's a gradient, well, 
what is it the gradient of? How do we get that potential function f so that we can apply the independence of path theorem? Well, let's see in the context of an example. Let's start with that one form on R2, quantity 2xy plus x dx minus quantity 5 minus x squared dy, that thing that we know is a gradient one form on R2. I know it's of the form df for some f, and that means, what do I do? Well, I integrate. I know that that first component, 2xy plus x, is really partial f partial x. So to get f, I simply integrate with respect to x. What does that give me? Well, that gives me, what, x squared y plus 1 half x squared. Oh, wait a minute. I think I'm forgetting something. Oh, that's right. I forgot the constant. I've got a constant there. But this is not a, a constant constant. It's a constant from the perspective of x. That means this constant might depend on y. Okay, that's a little tricky. Now, for the second component, x squared minus 5, that is partial f partial y. If I integrate that with respect to y, what do I get? I get x squared y minus 5y plus another constant, but this constant can depend on x. And so I see I've integrated to get f two different ways, and I have what looks like two different functions, but if I take these constants into account and merge them together, then I get a final answer of x squared y minus 5y plus 1 half x squared, and that's good. Now, at this point, someone's saying, ha ha, you forgot another constant. Well, yeah, there is a real constant that I could put in there, but you know, when I'm using this for the independence of path theorem, I really don't need that. Okay, that's a good example of how to do this in the plane. Let's see what happens when we move up a dimension. Let's say that we take that one form alpha that we looked at previously, quantity 3yz squared minus 4xz dx plus 3xz squared dy plus 2x times quantity 3yz minus x dz. We know that's a gradient. What happens when we try to integrate this? Well, I have my, my three different components. I know that that first component, 3yz squared minus 4xz, is really the partial of f with respect to x. And same thing with the second component and y, and the third component and z. And if I start doing some integrals, I look at that, it's pretty clear that one of the terms is 3xyz squared. But now, when I'm integrating, my constants depend on the other two variables, and it might not be as easy to merge everything together. On your own, on some scratch paper, you could show that the final answer, with some work, is 3xyz squared minus 2x squared z. Now, in n dimensions, this can be pretty painful. This can be a lot of work. But in low dimensions, you can do this.